I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Up from death. In the 1960s, an impossible dream came true. When human beings walked on another world. The eagle has landed. In all, 24 Americans went to the moon. But it took an unseen army of over 400,000 engineers and technicians to make it possible. This is the story of the men and women who built the machines that took us to the moon. As we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. In the summer of 1961, as the United States embarked on its great space adventure, one question above all others remained unresolved. What kind of spacecraft would take a man to the moon and bring him back alive? The United States had a total of 15 minutes of spaceflight experience, five minutes outside the Earth's atmosphere, and now we were committed to go to the moon. We knew nothing about the moon. No unmanned spacecraft had landed there or even taken decent pictures of it. It was very vague how we would even get to the moon, what would the vehicles look like, what kind of rocket we would need. During the initial briefings, everybody assumed the way to the moon was to send one huge spaceship all the way there and all the way back. But at NASA, they already knew there was a problem. It required landing a big, heavy, bulky spacecraft on the lunar surface. It required lifting an enormous amount of weight back off of the moon one additional disadvantage was that it required a rocket that probably was going to be 50, 60, maybe 70 feet high. And it finally occurred to some of the engineers, how are these astronauts going to get out of this big vehicle and get down on the lunar surface? As NASA puzzled over the problem, an obscure engineer called John Hobalt came up with a radical alternative. Instead of taking a single giant spaceship to the moon and back, why not build a second lightweight craft that would shuttle between the moon and a mothership? It would be smaller, lighter, and much more maneuverable there was only one massive drawback. To get back to Earth would require the lunar shuttle to rendezvous with the mothership in lunar orbit. What scared everybody about it is you have to rendezvous and dock around the moon. You're a quarter of a million miles from Earth. And he's proposing this in 1961, when we had no spaceflight experience, and just rendezvousing and docking in Earth orbit concerned everybody. Every time he brought the idea up, he was shut down. Everybody said that he didn't know what he was talking about. It was very embarrassing because he is a very quiet, very reserved, reticent man, and he was very taken back by the hostility. The opposition was led by NASA's foremost rocket expert, Werner von Braun, who had always favored the big rocket approach and now told Hubolt to cut the lunar rendezvous crap. Werner von Braun had a very strong ego, was very popular, in the United States, very famous in the United States because of his appearance on television, and believed very strongly in the idea of taking a big rocket to the moon. In desperation, Hobalt finally wrote directly to NASA's top leadership. In these letters, Dr. Hobalt said, 
I know that I'm stepping out of line here. I know I might even get fired because I'm writing this letter, but I think it's so important to bring this to your attention that I'm willing to risk my career in doing it. He said something like, I know I may be a pain in the neck and I shouldn't be writing this letter to you and so on, but I feel so strongly about this, I feel impelled to write to you. And he said in these letters to Dr. Siemens that the lunar orbit rendezvous idea was the only way to get us to the moon. Dr. Hobalt didn't say, I think it's one way, or he didn't say, I think it's the best way. He said, I think it's the only way. It was rather strident in the way it was written, and uh, my first reaction was, I'd like some way to get that son of a gun off my back. But Siemens was sufficiently intrigued to recommend that Hobalt's proposal should at least get a serious hearing. It was a turning point. At a meeting in June 1962, called to hammer out a solution, Von Braun took everybody by surprise. Everybody was getting together to again try and talk about what decision they were going to make on going to the moon. The Von Braun team gave a, a presentation and when they finished, Werner stood up and he said, I'm really proud of our group. He said, that was a wonderful presentation. You considered everything very, very carefully, but I have to tell you that that's not what I'm gonna recommend. I'm gonna recommend that we go lunar orbit rendezvous. It was such a surprise to everybody that even his own staff people uh, several days later had a private meeting with him and they said, why in the world did you say that? What led you to believe that? We were completely surprised that you decided to announce for lunar orbit rendezvous. Belatedly, von Braun had recognized it was the only way. And in the fall of 1962, U.S. aircraft manufacturers competed to build what became known as the Lunar Excursion Module, or LEM. 